up for the university. <laughs> there you go. Very nice. Hi, everyone. It's glad to be back. I am um, happy to moderate our next panel discussion. I'm Dr. David Chow, director of the Asian American program at Princeton Theological Seminary. In case people are just dropping into this. Yes? OK. I don't think I'm lagging. I think everything's good. We've had different connectivity issues with various folks. I'm going to try to organize this so we can have um, a greater sense of the order of who will be speaking. And I'm just making sure that we have all the various people uh, pinned in the main screen. And just an, uh, a logistics note, uh, for questions directed to the panelists, please use the Q&A tab. And for the audience, if you see a question that you resonate with and connect with, upvote it. When you upvote it, it pushes it up. And if you have general comments, please keep them on topic with respect to the conversation with the presenters and um, keep them in the chat section as opposed to the Q&A section. So thank you for that. For the next um, 40 minutes or so, we'll probably need a break before our last and concluding session at three o'clock. We will be discussing um, best practices and doing field work. And I just want to highlight that at three o'clock, we will have a closing conversation. And just to highlight that topic, because I, I really do want people to stay through until three. And I know it's a bit of a, an ask at three o'clock in the afternoon on a Saturday. But Jonathan Tran outlined four really important factors for organizing a new conversation in Asian American theology, roughly dealing with academic theory, um, organizing various communities, uh, partnering with local congregations, and developing a spirit and culture of hospitality. I think these are four very, very significant features for creating and organizing a new conversation with respect to Asian American theology. So I want to just plant that teaser at this point. We're making our way there. But I really do think that our discussion of fieldwork with respect to the ethical and political dimensions of doing this type of fieldwork, the kinds of relationships and um, normative commitments that are allowed to emerge through fieldwork are, are super important. And this is one of the distinctive features of this Asian American Theology Conference is to highlight ethnography, oral history, mixed methods of the quantitative um, sciences as ingredient to doing Asian American theology. So I just wanted to frame why we're having these conversations about ethnography, oral history, et cetera. So the question I wanna ask each of the seven speakers is this. From your field work, what are some of the best practices? We began doing this in the last hour, and I really want to just focus, this is a, a little bit of the nuts and bolts. So it gets a little bit nerdy, gets a little bit in the weeds, but I think we want to go there. And for the pastors who are listening in on the previous conversation, I think their interest may be piqued at this point to really um, sit and observe with the, the panelists here to hear what you've gone through to discipline yourselves in listening to others, and also importantly, to identify the divine, the sacred. Um, what does it mean to understand God to be working in the messiness of these local contexts? So best practices in terms of uh, what you've done well in the past that you will continue to do when you do field work and mistakes you've made. What are things that you wish your current self would have told your previous self as you embarked on this adventure called field work? And so let me just identify now the order because I want each of the speakers to share. Sorry about that. It'll be Melissa, Jane, and Jerry. And then we'll go with Easton, Jillian, Geoman, and then Jonathan. So Melissa, please share your thoughts with us. So I have two things I would say. The first is about research in general. 
And the second is about the particular things I learned while doing field work. So a bit of personal background about myself. I decided to be a researcher and to pursue a career in academia right after 9-11. And it was in the context of seeing tremendous suffering and in particular grieving alongside my Muslim friends who were being targeted uh, in the wake of the uh, attacks on September 11th. I began really thinking about how I could use my skills and talents and particular energies and interests to make the world better and in particular to address how um, we can get along with people who are racially, religiously, culturally different from other people. So that is the center question of a lot of my research is um, understanding how to create um, a religiously plural world that is safe and inclusive for all. Um, and so I think one thing that is orienting me, orienting me to my work and guiding me always is this idea that we can change the world only if we understand the world. That is, in order to make the world better, we need to have um, knowledge to guide our choices. So when I have research meetings with my team, the team that is studying anti-Asian racism um, during COVID-19, I often ask them, and we think through this collectively, remember what our mission is. And we all are here because we want to help build a safe and inclusive community, and we want to keep our community safe. Um, and so what would be most useful for the different parts of our community? What would be most useful for the Asian American community organizer in Lexington, Kentucky? and the Chinese American pastor in Kansas, and the um, Asian student visiting from Korea going to school in San Francisco. So we try to think about what they need and we have their feedback and their needs guiding our work at all times. So I think having a real clear sense of mission is really, really important. The second thing I would say is being really humble about your work and being open to being transformed. I've said this over and over again, but I'll say it again. I think um, approaching research with the possibility, knowing the possibility that you could be really wrong in your assumptions is really important. So I always talk about how when I first started doing um, research on my first book manuscript, which is about Hmong religious change, I thought I had an explanation for why many Hmong people adopted Christianity when they resettled in the United States. And this explanation was based on archival records. It was based on books I had read. And I don't think it was a wrong explanation. I think it was just an incomplete explanation based on the things I happened to have available to me. But then I went to Minnesota and I did dozens of oral history interviews with Hmong Christians there. And I realized that their choices were much more complicated than I had assumed. So I was basing my explanation based on some information, but not all information, and my worldview and not their worldview. So it was through conversations with them that I realized their decision to become Christian was shaped by things that were going on in the seen world and things that they were going that were going on in the unseen spiritual world, and that their decisions were very much shaped by living between the seen and unseen world. So this reveals a cosmology that I didn't have. I'm not Hmong American myself. Um, and it revealed that there were real limitations to making an argument based solely on archives. The reality is the spirits don't leave archives. And so this was a big research challenge for historians who only use the, do the documents that exist in the libraries. So um, I'll put the citation for the article that I wrote about that process of being transformed through conversations with among American Christians. Um, but I think that spirit of humility that I acquired through that process is something I, I really carry forward. So whenever I, I talk to people, when I do oral history interviews, I don't create the questions ahead of time. I never do. Actually I advise explicitly against this. And what I do is instead have topics and I generate all of my questions based on what other the people I'm talking to tell me. Um, and that is really nerve wracking because people always ask, well, what if I don't know what to ask next? 
to which I say that requires you to listen really carefully. So everything you say, I think, and ask should be based on what they just said. I always also joke that, you know, if you become a really good oral historian, you listen really well and learn how to ask really good questions, it will also set you up for an excellent dating life, which my students often joke about. Uh, but that's for another conversation. So I'll stop there. No, that was really great. Um, so my caveat is I'm only part way through the process. Um, so I'm still interviewing, still doing field work. Um, so I'm also learning from many of you all who have done much more in this area. Um, and I think there are particular challenges that come from the point when you publish. So what Jonathan mentioned earlier, that kind of fear of feeling like you're betraying some of the folks that you talk to when you present your work back to them, I have yet to, to experience that. So um, I'm learning from many of you and um, I'm very grateful actually to learn from many of you. So I think for me as someone who's newer to oral histories, I've learned a lot from Melissa. So I, I, I think one thing that oral historians, or oral history tries to do is take a more holistic view of people's lives. And so even if you know there are particular questions I have about a particular episode of someone's life, um, you know, I still ask questions and there's a whole set of guidelines from the Oral History Association that, that kind of walks folks through this. And I learned a lot of, of this from those guidelines, from talking to people like Melissa who have done a lot more oral, oral history research. But the idea is you situate their you know, responses about like 1985 in the kind of more holistic context of their entire lives. Cause that's what historians are all about as I'm sure Many of you have gen uh, kind of gleaned by now, right? Again, the whole question of context, context. So trying to understand um, different episodes like, within the long expanse of people's lives. So that's one thing. I think that's really important um, for oral history in particular. Um, Open-ended conversations. Um, so kind of building on what Melissa shared. So I do send um, just some sample questions at the beginning. A lot of my uh, interviewees ask for questions. So I do send questions, but then I say, um, you know, I at any point, you know, I, I might follow up on things that you that you talk about. Um, I might add questions, and at the very end of our conversations, you know, I always ask, and this is part of the good practices that are recommended. I always ask, like, is there anything that we haven't talked about that you would that you consider really important? Um, because you know, I tell I tell folks that I talk with, I'm writing a book about Asian American evangelicalism <laughs> since the 1970s, um, and thinking about how immigration and kind of race and questions about politics and religion, right? How, how these kind of have shaped and changed evangelical institution of politics. So they kind of know the general, they, they know, right? What the general parameters of the project are. And so I said, is, so I say, is there anything I ask, is there anything that you think is really important for me to know? Because I don't, I don't know everything. Um, I'm still learning along with you. And it gives folks, it gives folks the opportunity to teach me and also to, I don't know, to, to speak into the project. And there are many things that I've learned in the process of even just doing a few dozen interviews so far. Um, and one other thing that I think I've really appreciated, you know, I've interviewed many um, older folks, people who have retired, people who are kind of at the end of long lives, um, oftentimes in ministry. And, you know, I think for folks who are retired and kind of thinking about, they're thinking back to their very long lives and their long ministries, you know, they're thinking about legacies as well, like their legacies, right? So what are the things, like everybody wants to be remembered. Um, and I think for Asian American Christians, especially folks who are laboring in like the 1970s and 1980s, during a time when there are even fewer Asian Americans than there are now, and there's less media visibility, less attention, just less everything, um, less prestige, less everything basically. Um, so for folks who, especially for folks who feel, who have felt invisible for a lot of their lives and felt very overlooked, you know, my hope is that part of this process could be a way for them to feel heard, right? And so I think, again, and this is something I think maybe all of us can resonate with because Asian Americans, generally speaking, right, have moments of kind of hyper visibility like now, but, you know, those are kind of brief moments punctuating a general narrative of, um, being overlooked and invisible. So, you know, I think letting folks, yeah, shape the narrative and kind of tell me what they think is important is I think one of the best things, best practices that I've 
that I've been able to implement. And that's also led to a lot of really fruitful conversations. Yeah, uh, building off of uh, those answers, I wanted to just share a few of the uh, sort of tidbit points, uh, um, nuts and bolts, as David pointed out, uh, on what helped me when I was doing uh, interviews. I've done interviews for my uh, dissertation and first book, as well as uh, for um, a study on uh, how churches make work meaningful for uh, their church going attenders, right? So uh, I've done interviews in, in different capacities. and. Uh, one of the important takeaways uh, is everything that happens before that interview. If the interview is, in a sense, a performance to a certain extent, right, uh, you want to prepare for it. So uh, you want to let on that you are interested in talking to this community. So uh, one of the best practices we usually encourage in the sociology of religion is to come up with a pre-letter. You send out that letter to that particular community and just you know, introduce yourself because it's a cold introduction and just say, this is what I'm interested in doing. Uh, could we have a follow-up uh, phone call conversation? And then you call the church and then uh, you know, just proceed to keep going forward until they say no. <laughs> and they're gonna say no a lot, especially the, the, uh, the more minoritized that community uh, feels uh, within a particular context. So uh, do all of that as you're coming up with your questions. Um, uh, keeping in mind what Melissa was saying, which I think is a great uh, way of doing it too, uh, having a sort of open interview process. I've been trained with a more closed interview kind of approach where they say it's it's better for you to practice through a script of certain topics and maybe certain ways of framing the questions that you want to ask. Practice it. Don't, don't just walk in there and just hope that everything's going to fall together. Uh, practice it through just to see uh, how do your friends even understand what you just asked? Did, did that question even make any sense? So uh, there's uh, some of that as well. So, uh, and thirdly, um, when you're deciding which communities to visit, uh, take some time to think about what is your actual question and how are the communities, and I always recommend going to at least two communities, uh, how are these communities similar to or different from each other such that it actually answers some part of that research question that you have? So if you're looking at, uh, like we were looking at places where churches emphasize in their mission statement that work is a really sacred thing and that's really important for them to, to process through. Other churches never mention work and, and uh, employment at all in their mission statement. So we wanted to visit these two types of churches. And just like Melissa was saying, we were uh, uh, really surprised to find that there's not a huge difference. And so, you know, this, this led to all kinds of existential anxiety, like, oh no, do we have no findings? I don't know what to do. Um, but it turns out that there are other kinds of dynamics that were taking place in both of these communities that even though one has it in their mission statement, the other one doesn't have it in their mission statement, the way people talk about work and how it's meaningful, how it's sacred, uh, was actually quite different. So uh, there was still a lot to be gleaned from that experience. So uh, come in as much as you can with a certain degree of like, I know what my questions are, I, I know roughly where I'd wanna go, uh, practice it through, uh, and make sure to introduce yourself instead of just uh, hoping that they'll be cooperative as soon as you walk in front of the church doors. Thanks so much uh, for all of that. I guess there's a reason why it's called best practices because uh, you know I, they, what's been said is a lot of what I would have said. <laughs> um, I guess I can shed a little bit of new light on, on some of the sim similar practices that have been shared. Um, for me, it, surprise and humility sort of echoing Dr. Borja are, are so important. But I'm gonna inject that with a bit of the theology just given my, my disciplinary standpoint. Um, for me, the, the surprise part is where God is working. Um, for most of us, we come in with a plan, we think we know what we're doing, and if you do field work, you are bound to hit unexpected surprises, things that you just didn't think were going to happen. Your hypothesis may be off, it might be incomplete. But I honestly think that these are the points where God's presence can speak. Um, I, 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 I'm, I'm um, mindful that, you know, Dr. Brown was talking about spirits, actually, in, her, in what was surprising to her. And I think it's similar. The presence of God is a surprising presence. And I know that was true for my field work. So um, I would say, be prayerful about any interruptions or surprises that come along in your research, things you didn't expect, like maybe COVID-19 and having to do all of your work digitally. Maybe God is doing something through that surprise 
that wasn't part of your plan. And, uh, and we all have uh, even per perhaps faith journeys that reflect some of that. The second thing that I would like to emphasize, which has to do with the humility that has been shared before, is about really not just trusting your informants, but double checking with your informants regularly. I don't like doing a single interview and never talking to people again. I, I think a series of interviews is most important because you need to double check reflective listening after you've worked with the data a little bit. For me, that's really, really important. And treating my, I, I would sum this up as treating my informants as experts, as opposed to the traditional relationship is I'm the researcher, I know a lot, and I'm just extracting data from you because I'm going to do something with it. Um, instead, it's a process of I'm, 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 extract, I'm, I'm gathering data from you, but I want to reflect it back to you. And we both need to agree on what's going on here. So I, I found in my experience that a, 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 it's always it was always good to do to schedule two interviews, um, one sort of open, one perhaps more detailed, sort of like what uh, what what uh, Jerry was talking about, and and a, another one that's more open. That's kind of what uh, what uh, Melissa was talking about. You need both of those things working together sometimes, and that was really useful for me. Um, through that reflection, and this might be unique to me because I was working in, in um, multiple languages um, in terms of Chinese, and, and, and you know, but you have to, words matter a lot uh, when you're working in multiple languages. Um, I was trying to work with this question about God's presence, and the way presence sits in Chinese and Mandarin Chinese isn't always the way it, it works in English. Um, Chinese will say zai, but that kind of means just to exist, and that's not kind of what you're going for. So you, what you, and as I was listening to people's answers, I was like, I've got to find some other words here. So when you ask a question, especially if you have certain key words that you think are really important to your hypothesis or your data, come up with another, come up with a list of similes and work with those different words in your, like ask the same question three times with different words. And you get, you get some really interesting stuff because sometimes they, they interpret the question completely differently, but you were, you were trying to create a convergence anyway. So I hope that makes sense in terms of wording and questioning. And lastly, um, what an important part for me was, uh, and, and this is sort of some of the, the nerdy terms, right? Triangulating your data. Um, and by triangulating, we mean it's not just two things. It's not just the researcher and the informant, you know, reflecting data back to each other. There's also the, what I call the material context. And historians are, are, are great with the archival dimension of this. It's not just what the congregation member says. It's not just what the researcher thinks. It's literally the church newsletters that date back to like, you know, whenever. And you need to triangulate all of these opinions, your opinion, their opinion, and the material data. For sociologists, you know, and, and anthropologists, it's, it's, it's literally the material stuff, the way that the church was set up, you know, uh, the way that uh, where the church is in the neighborhood. Uh, the kind of wall, you know, like, and, and thinking about context, right? So you need to triangulate that data. And for all of me, for, for me, that is about, again, as a practical theologian, if you will, um, which is different than perhaps um, historians and sociologists, my end goal is always to discern something about what God is doing, um, to try to figure that out. Um, and, and so for me, and, and, you know, I draw a lot from Robert Orsi in terms of uh, presence, you know. Uh, for me, God is a part of the research project. Like the presence of God is a real and active. And that's going to be, you know, secular academic thought is not going to deal well with that. You know, it's not, it's, it's, so it's not even just triangulating informant, researcher, and material. It's God. There's a fourth presence there, and it is God. And it, that takes some contemplative thought, some prayer, some reflection, building in uh, prayer practices into, in, into the entire research process for me was important, just given my ends. So those are some of my thoughts. Yeah, so my research process involves uh, field observation and semi-structured interviews. So uh, I don't, uh, well, I, I, the conversation is not is not free flow is structured but at the same time i don't i there are questions that um it will come in different orders or i might miss or like depending on how the how the um participant is interacting with me and so um 
I find I find it super helpful to keep a field and interview journal for me. And and I kind of date it so that um, I'm able to go back to it when when I want to refer to something in my thesis. And so and I also tag it so that I know where I want this to belong to and this idea. And so like everybody else, the best idea comes to me in the shower. And so like I need somewhere where I can just jot things down really quickly. And so um, my field journal is not like me sitting on like a writing desk going like, dear diary, it's nothing like that at all. It's 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 a mess. It's it sometimes it's typed, sometimes it's just audio recording because I'm like I'm running and like, oh that that's my phone as so I'm just speaking into it. And there's sometimes it's like I was scribbling on like a bit of paper and then just took a photo of it. Sometimes it's pamphlets that I get. Sometimes it's it's just a place where I keep everything. And so that I'm able to later when I want to go and code my data, um, that's where I can draw. And it's in a file, filing system in terms of dates, in terms of where it should belong in the research and the kind of different ideas that it's related to. And so that has been very helpful for me in this process. And I'm super, super glad that at the beginning of my um, PhD journey that I've been recommended to do this because now I have a database to refer back to in terms of like um, good ideas that I can um, write more about or like, and even like the, sometimes we have to like kill our darlings. And so it's also a great place to keep that as well because when I'm able to, like write something down already. Um, I feel like I've done my bit. And so like, um, maybe it will never make it to the thesis, maybe it will never make it to the published work, but I wrote it already. And so it's in some ways therapeutic for me. And I feel like it's, it's out there. And so, and so that has been very helpful. And I resonate with Dr. Hong and how she was saying how asking the participant, um, um, what they would like to contribute and I would do that too and I would ask them like say um, What do you think I should have taken away with this conversation or like? Um, what did you say to me that you didn't realize you thought that until? Um, you s verbalized it and or like if you were me What would you have asked like if you were the researcher and those are the questions that I like the most because um, it's just so surprising. Like it could be literally anything and and it really steers the conversation. And so the participant really has like the power in that situation. And I, I really enjoyed that. I've also really enjoyed writing public engagement pieces and like doing podcasts because I've been able to share that like standalone piece with my participants. and. Um, also, like as Dr. Trent said, like with trepidation and fear, like I'm like I don't know what they will tell me. Like um, they it could react really badly, but also it's it's great when they push back because um, then I can think deeper about the certain points um, that um, I've talked about and how I could um, probe deeper into those ideas. And so um, points that have I have received pushback on uh, are points that I have developed like the best and I like the most. And so I really enjoy um, doing public engagement pieces too. Yeah. One of the best practices that was shared with me was by my mentor uh, from University of Edinburgh, Jack Thompson. He was an amazing professor in so many ways. But I remember in one of the classes uh, he shared with us, start with what is before you. And I always, always kept that in mind. Start with what is before you. And you'd be surprised, he said, what is before you. Look around, pause, reflect, and start from that point. And then you will see things begin to emerge. And that has been true in my own research, working with the Indian American communities, I always started with what was before me. That leads to relationship. Relationship is so crucial because initially you may have one person, but that person may point to others, so on and so forth, providing a larger net network. So first, start with what is before you. Second, relationship is important. You are not 
interviewing or visiting the congregation to write a book, you are there because you want to see what God is at work. You want to learn from that congregation. You want to learn from that person. So it's a posture of learning. And once the person you are having conversation with trusts you enough, then they will point to others uh, within their community that you can have longer conversations. And finally, don't be afraid to try new things. We are trained to think in certain way. But if you think outside our box, try new things, you'd be amazed to see what fruits it may emerge. So my, the, these are the three best practices that I want to share with all of you today. Uh, I don't have anything to add um, to all the great things I've said. And anyways, I was thinking I, I've said entirely too many serious things over the last two days, and there's not, they have nothing left that's serious in me. But I have an observation, and I want to see who else has had this observation. Is it me, or does Melissa Borja have a seriously impressive eyewear game? I mean, it's like those glasses, right? And I mean, me and Dave have been like on Zoom with her like several times a week for the last year or something. And every week I'm looking at her glasses and my own ugliness. And then I'm looking at David, who's like got a face. Anything he asked me, I say, yes. Just like look at the face, you know? And um, you no know, wonder he got a thousand people to this thing because it, God gifted him with like a warm, hospitable face. And I have this. And then Melissa's got her glasses. So recently it was time for me to get new glasses. And I'm like, I'm going to up my game. So I went to the optometrist and they said, you know, here's all the uh, options for women. You know, it's gendered in this thing. And it's like, you know, rows and rows of amazing pairs of glasses, Melissa game level. And then they're like, here's one shelf for men. <laughs> <laughs> and they're all like nerd dork glasses that I already own. I mean, there's no doubt in our society, men are advantaged in every way possible, except for fashion. I mean, you know, it's a very narrow set of options. Uh, so Melissa's glasses, I mean. It's her uh, glasses. The skateboard has gotten many call outs. Skateboard call -outs. in the background? Like who's got a skateboard and in the, the background? background. And the background, the color display. That's um, my, my wife noticed the background immediately. So, you know, Jonathan is modeling something really important here, which is a sense of humor. I think all too, I think all too often, theology is the queen of the sciences. We think it's, you know, we're kind of gripped by this uber seriousness. But um, so far, what I've heard is this field work, this ethnography, this oral history, it involves relationships. It involves listening. It, it involves our humanity. And we ought not take ourselves too seriously. I think a sense of humor is dispossessive, which is one of the themes that we've heard earlier. So thank you, Jonathan, for yeah, inserting. Yeah, I mean, you know, it's, it's absolutely critical to have like very serious conversations. Uh, Isaac Kim and John Bolin um, at PTS hosted a really great conference on my manuscript last year, made it way better. And I have a whole group of friends for, you know, who are not Asian American, who are critical race theorists, who help me think through things. But I also wanna say, you gotta cultivate like a series of irreverent people friendships. <laughs> like, you know, my, like my family, every night they have to live with me in this, this book. So I'll share some ideas and then we'll be eating and, then, and I'll share some idea that we like, Pappy, are, are you like high? That makes no sense what you're talking about right now. Or that doesn't help me at all as an Asian American kid in a high school of all non-Asian Americans. Like, get over yourself. Uh, like sometimes I'll be talking and my wife will put a um, little pretend microphone in front of my face because <laughs> that, that means I've been talking too long. Or I have like this group of grad students. They're like brilliant, brilliant people. Like one of them knows more about race theory than anyone I know. One knows more about socialism than anyone I know. A couple of them just they'll send me these memes like Isaiah I, Isaiah Zhang, who's a, like a rising star in sociology at UIC University of Illinois Chicago. He like made this meme of me <laughs> where I was holding like I was wearing this black leather jacket and like a red pill or a blue pill. <laughs> and he's just like started populating this out there in the world. Yeah, the the cultivation of irreverent um, relationships, you know, keep you grounded. <laughs> you remind me, well, you remind you, one, you're just you. One of the benefits of a virtual online conference is gathering people across space and across space and time, time zones. 
one of the benefits of an in-person is we would have meals together. We would have chapel together. We would have sacred space and sacred time together. We would go out for boba together. I see a, a hashtag for boba being generated in our chat box. Now, here's my transition to an actual question I saw posted, and it's about digital ethnographies. So I think, let me, let me direct this one to um, Easton. I'm gonna call him upstage here. So Easton, I think you mentioned something about, um, let me just get the question here. What do we lose by doing eth ethnographic interviews digitally? Uh, they want to hear more about the research limits. And I, and I think Jonathan also has done some digital ethnography. So I'll, I'll pull him back on stage as well. Um, what's obviously lost when you at least do digital interviews um, in particular um, is you lose a, a strong relational element um, hmm. that just comes with physical presence and getting to know their context um, and, and being invited in. Um, what I did find, however, and this has to do with, again, changing media ecology, which is a whole different academic field, but it's actually really important if you wanna get a handle on field work in the digital age. But what I found is also, it, it depends on the personality you're with. Sorry to, to, to cut myself off. It depends on the personality, because for some, the digital medium makes it very hard to connect. But for others, the digital medium is freeing. They are naturally introverted. They don't like meeting in contexts that are not exactly where they're most comfortable. And something about talking to a stranger through a screen actually opens them up in a way that you would never be able to do in person. And I can't tell you how you can discern one personality from another. So who do you schedule the digital one with and who do you schedule the in-person one with? But it is definitely an observation that I have um, seen uh, developed over, uh, over my interviews. So, and uh, I'll, I'll let uh, Dr., uh, Dr. Tran follow up on that. Yeah, I mean, the digital gives you access in all kinds of ways you would you simply would not have, especially if you have other obligations other than that geographic locale. So um, in terms of what you miss, I think I have a I have a line in the book and on on the fact that I had to do almost all my stuff digitally is that I, I'll simply never know all that I missed. Right. I don't even know what I don't know, because I you know, I think uh, Dr. George put it really well it's being in a place, it's the smells, it's the sight lines, it's the history, right? It's the way the air hangs. Um, that is really mm -hmm. important. And I, I, and I simply don't even know what I've missed along these lines. So, you know, I, I feel like it's a, it's a significant loss of the ethnographic part of it, um, but there's other benefits in terms of what um, Dr. Law just said, and I think those are relevant too. Does and I would actually like, Oh, well, I would actually like to pull Jillian in in a second, because yeah. when we talk about digital field work, there's the interview side of things, which is a whole uh, set of things that we've just talked about. But in reference to what uh, Dr. Tran was talking about, losing the sense, the sense, the sense, senses of uh, being in a place. These days, uh, when I talk about the material context, uh, the Internet is a source of material context. Um, checking websites, listening to archived videos these kinds of things, um, especially since Jillian was working with the Hong Kong movement, which was largely online organized. And so you're, you're dealing with a whole different ecosystem of materials even. And, and I don't know if Jillian wants to speak to that. So um, I, I don't actually analyze what's um, the, the vast amount of data that Easton was just mentioning. but. Um, what I do know, though, is that um, um, people have been talking on Telegram a lot, and so um, there's been there's been um, volunteers that's been going to court hearings and transcribing that onto Telegram onto a channel, and there's been researchers who's been taking that data and coding it, and so there's this huge database in in that's that's um, that's being generated entirely by volunteers. So the data was um, taken down by court, by 
at the court by volunteers and it's cataloged by volunteers and it's also being read by volunteers and so no nobody is legal professional or um no our or a researcher they're doing it out of their own volition and so i i am super impressed with the set of data and i i am excited to see how it will be used in future and so there's a lot of ha it's because it's also text so like not only like um what the what the court proceedings are but also how um the interactions and that and the time and the person and so it's all sorted and it's all now freely available online and so if this um what's been happening in Hong Kong is of your interest you should go and search for it i i will try and find it link and drop it in the chat i uh, in a bit yeah very good um one of the feelings i was getting listening to this session and the practical wisdom shared from all the field research was, it's okay to bring my humanity into my research. I just think this is, it, it sounds so basic, but in ministry, the way I've been trained in ministry is, oh yes, you should bring your feelings, you should bring your discernment of the Holy Spirit, you should bring your whole person, but in academics, you're kind of taught to just bring your mind or your eyes or what have you. And what I'm getting is ethnography is a holistic method, much attuned to spiritual direction. Uh, I've taken some spiritual theology courses, spiritual direction courses, spiritual friendship, and a lot of the virtues and skills that we've been talking about the last two hours are mirrored in spiritual formation, spiritual exercises, uh, a kind of contemplative approach that incorporates one's uh, discernment of the physical surroundings, one's self-understanding, and also a discernment of how God, the divine, the sacred might be at work. And so this has been a, a truly generative conversation. I wanna um, pause now to give us eight minutes to, to kind of uh, stretch our legs, um, do what we need to do. And we're gonna have a concluding half hour discussion again with all the speakers at three o'clock. And I wanna discuss um, the next the next stage for the conversation. We, I want us to reflect on our journey these last two days and for us to reflect together on some of the points that Jonathan Tran mentioned, the four points that he mentioned for having a new conversation about Asian American theology. So let's put a pause here and we'll reconvene in seven minutes now. Thank you. <laughs>